All right, so let's get started here. Um, so I'm going to be going over the, the project today. Um, I'm the instructor for Section 3 out at EPIC, so um, I'll be recording this for both them and, and for you guys. So uh, feel free to ask uh, questions, and I'll try to repeat the questions for both people in the video and those who can't hear, but tr please try to remind me if I, if I forget to repeat a question. So um, P4 just rolled out, and there are two parts of it. Uh, there's in Linux, you're going to build a scalable web crawler. So you're going to have multiple threads that are downloading content from the internet and then parsing that. And then the second part is that you're going to be adding kernel threads to uh, XV6. So currently, you have a bunch of processes in XV6, but they all have independent uh, address spaces. You're going to be modifying um, those structures so that sometimes you can have something that looks like a process, but they're sharing the same address space. So you can modify that existing code to get threads um, and basically turn what they have as processes in, into threads. So today I'm just going to be talking about this first part in Linux, the scalable web server. So how, how many people have written any code that uh, scrapes anything online before? Okay, so just like one, a couple people. So it could be pretty useful for a number of reasons. Um, what the, one of the big reasons is if you want to build some sort of search engine, right? Google doesn't just um, by, by default have all the content on the web, so they have to have crawlers that uh, discover new content, um, and they do that in a number of ways. One of the, the biggest ways they'll find new content is they'll look for links on the existing content they've downloaded, and then those links will point them to new pages, and they can uh, follow that content and then download it and then parse it. So if you're building a, a search engine, you have to do a number of steps. You have to do this crawling step, and then you have to do some uh, processing where you determine things like page rank, and you might be looking at which pages have a lot of links to them. Those might be uh, viewed as more important pages. And you're also going to be caring about content, so you want to not only figure out how important the page is, but what it's relevant to. So you're going to do all this indexing stuff after you've crawled, and after you've indexed, then you're actually going to be serving live queries. As you have queries coming in, you actually have to use all that indexing work you did to figure out which search results to return. So maybe we'll end up uh, covering search engines at, uh, in more detail at some point in the semester. But this project is just focused on that first step. How can we download and, uh, par and then parse this content? Um, so I have some background here talking about what search engines do. Um, so uh, for these searching and crawling steps, we're going to want to have multiple threads for both of both of these. So wh why might we want to have multiple um, multiple threads downloading at the same time? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. You can overlap processing with downloading, and also you can do more things concurrently. Uh, it, it's not unreasonable that a web request could take 100 milliseconds, so there's a lot of time where packets are just being sent over the internet and your machine is idle. So we could potentially have um, hundreds of outgoing requests happening simultaneously and not even saturate our, our local CPU. So for, for the downloaders, we definitely want to have a lot of threads for those. Um, what about for the parsers? Why might we want to if we're just parsing pages that we already have downloaded and is in memory, why would we want to have multiple threads parsing? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so definitely, um, so as we're parsing, we're going to discover new links, and then we're going to set that aside as work to download. So, so we're going to have two, two pools of threads, right? One that is doing all the downloading, and one that's um, another pool of thread that's doing the parsing. So we definitely want multiple downloaders, but why, why would we want more than one parser thread going? So, so the main reason we want to do that is we want to take advantage of multiple CPU cores, right? Even though we have some thread here that's never going to be blocking, we want to take advantage of multiple CPUs. So for the downloaders, the, the main concern is how we can interleave, right, and, and, do, and have a lot of threads that are, are blocked at the same time. And then for the parsers, it's how can we take advantage of multiple CPUs. If you had only one CPU core and, um, and your task, the parser, never had to block on I.O. or anything, then it would make sense to just have a single, single parsing thread. Uh, but that's not the case. We have multiple. Oh, uh, yeah, question. Why am I not seeing this uh, page on the website? Uh, it, it should be. I don't, I don't think it's on the calendar yet. Um, but if you look over on the side, it says not April Fool's uh, Day. Oh, 
There's a project. So, yeah. So anyway, um, I, I've, we've set up a simple website for you to crawl. Uh, most websites in are in HTML. It's a markup language where you can describe things like links and other uh, kind of visual formatting. And um, you're certainly welcome to do some more complex parsing to handle those, but you could also imagine websites that are, are in plain text. Um, so that's what we're going to be having, having you crawl. So here's um, typically a home page will be index.html or index.txt. So I have a, a home page set up here. And then the format for links is very simple. It'll just be link colon and then some address. And, and unfortunately, since this is an HTML, we can't just click on these. Um, so it's, it's kind of a terrible website. But the way you navigate this website is if you see a link, you can copy that, and then you can visit that page. I see, oh, page one, well, that has another link. So you can see that this is transitive. Like each, each page has other links, so I have to explore these. The other problem is that there, there may be loops, right? This is going back to the home page. So when you're building your crawler, you're going to have to be very careful that um, you don't keep processing and downloading the same page over and over again. You're going to have to use some sort of concurrent hash set to keep track of what you've seen before. Okay, so we have links, and then also you may have problems where it's not a link, but maybe you branch off to multiple pa pages, and then those pages both link back to a common page. So it'd be like a, a directed acyclic graph, right? So you have to deal with all these um, uh, different graph structures. Okay, so that's a simple site. Um, the other thing we're going to be doing is um, just just for kind of the sake of testing and maybe generality, we're going to uh, you're going to build your crawler in such a way that it's a library, and you can plug in different pieces to it. So we're going to plug in a different downloader, um, and then also the piece that uh, basically lets you do the processing. So uh, what that means is you could plug in different downloaders, and you could um, we could provide you with a downloader that instead of downloading things from the web, um, is just fetching local files, and that's convenient um, for, uh, for basically testing. And also you could imagine maybe you want to index all the files in your file system for a local search. Um, so what we'll also do is we'll give you a number of files that I'm going to look at here. So these are just local files on the file system, and you, you'll have to explore these as well. Okay. So let's take a look at, at a working example here. So I'm going to be careful not to open my code since this is, this is complete. But um, let, me, let me take a peek at this make file here. So basically the thing you're producing is going to be this libcrawler.so. Okay. And so you can modify this make file as you want. We're giving this to you as, as a starting point. Um, but basically, libcrawler so just has to expose um, one function. We'll be talking more about what this does. So what, what this will let us do is that uh, a program that is using your crawler library can specify a starting URL or, or a link that it wants to search from. And then you have to discover all links by branching out from that one. And we're going to specify a number of things, how many download workers are going to be running concurrently, how many parse workers, um, and then I'll, I'll be talking more about the queues. And then we're also passing you a couple of function pointers here, and I'll, I'll be looking at these more. And these are basically the, the callbacks. Um, so what this will let you do is when you want to download a page, you don't have to write all that HTTP fetching code yourself. You could just call this function that we provide to you. So for some of our tests, let me, let me pull up a test quick. Um, I have... Uh, let me look at my web tester. So we're, we're setting up crawling here, and we're passing you this fetch function. So let me look at the fetch function. And this fetch, fetch function, you can basically see um, it, it's fetching things from that simple website we had set up. Or similarly, if I look at the file tester, then the fetch function is going to be a little bit different. It's going to be opening up local files in the file system. Okay. So I have this built now, so this is a working working crawler. So I can do, if I want to do the, let's actually do the web tester first. Um, okay, so I'm going to do the web tester, and I'm going to start at index.txt. I'm going to time this. And, oh, do, we, do people remember this? So I just want to review this um, briefly, because when you have these shared libraries, you have to set up this uh, load library path so you know where to find that library, right? So one way I could do that is I could say set load library, um, uh, and then I could set that to the local directory. Um, what might be more convenient for you is if you look in your, your bash RC file, you could set up these kinds of environment variables um, 
when you start. So I commented this out for the sake of, of demonstrating that. So I'm going to leave that there. So if I have this in my .bashrc in my home directory, then it'll set up that load library path for me every time, and it will always look for shared libraries in, in, the, in my current working directory. Okay, so I'm going to have that set up now. So if I, if I created a new bash session, it would set that up for me. Um, I'm not creating a new bash session right now, so what I should really do is I should run source on it so it will have been run. Okay, so I have that, so now let me actually run my, my crawler here. And it's a little slow. Okay, so it's fetching some pages. It's trying to recursively tr crawl out from these. And, and basically what the, the crawling library is doing is every time, so not only do we give, pass you a function pointer to fetch, but we pass you a function pointer to something called edge. And so edge is right here. So every time your crawling library finds a link between two pages, you should be calling this edge function as a way to basically um, return everything that you find as you go. Um, so this is almost done here. And, and you'll notice that um, index um, went to page one and then page one went to page 1a and page 1a is drawing back to index, but will not actually um, will not actually loop on that. I don't know why the server is being so laggy here. Normally it just completes. I'm going to kill this because that's taking too long. Um, but if we wanted to make that faster, one of the things we could do is, um, let's take a look here, we could, we could have more download and parse workers running at the same time, and also I could, I, we're going to have a queue between those set up. So let me just make some of these values larger. So hopefully this should be a little bit faster. It's still the website's very slow for some reason. Actually, um, let me just look at something very quickly here. Okay, I actually put a sleep in there for debugging purposes. Um, so I'm going to actually just... Uh, well, I don't really want to um, open that code since it's a complete solution. Let me actually just get rid of that code because I actually want to compare the timings. Uh, so I'm going to get rid of that. Great, such a different of it. So sorry about that. That no wonder it was um, so slow. So anyway, let me get the timings on both of these again. So so now I'm running where I have many threads. I have ten, um, ten downloaders and ten, um, and ten parsers. So let me see how long this takes to complete. Okay, so that was 15 seconds. Let me let me run it just one more time, where I have less concurrency, and I'll let this run in the background while we talk about something else, so it's not wasting the time. Um. So what what else can we talk about while that's happening? Yeah. So in the simulation worker case, mm -hmm. in the downloader and in the parser, yeah. if phase one was discovered first, why wasn't that many followers there? Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. So so he's asking uh, when we have just a single um, a single downloader and a single parser, why don't we since we found page one first, why don't we process that first? Mm -hmm. and, and basically um, we're calling so we, we're gonna have a, a queue. Um, we're actually going to have two queues, right? The parsers are generating links 
for the downloader. So we'll have a link queue and we'll also have a page queue. And um, people use queues in different ways. Some, sometimes when people say queue, they very strictly mean something where you uh, uh, pen to the end and pop off the front. Um, more generally in systems, people often just mean a, a, a list of work waiting to be done and you might reshuffle those things on that queue and it might, might not be a, a strict queue. Um, so that's the case here. Um, for simplicity, I don't really care about which pages I download first, so I implemented my queue as a linked list, a singly linked list where I always push on the front and then pop from the front. Um, so you're free to do that as well, or you could um, do some sort of other ordering on your queue. Uh, it's basically, yeah, my queue is basically a stack. So first and is last out for, for my queue, the way I implemented the queue, just for simplicity. And that's fine if you want to do that too. So I'm kind of using queue in the broader system sense. So you can see this took 35 seconds. Um, when I just have one worker, whereas when I had multiple workers, I could get down to 15 seconds. And as, as you branch out to more and more pages, um, that difference will become even even more striking. So let me just run the file tester quick. The file tester is a lot faster, so it should be um, good for this and for also your tests. And you see, um, sure enough, it finds finds all of these links. So I'm going to actually open all of these right now. Okay, so uh, let's um, take a look at some skeleton code. So you have to do the vast majority of coding yourself here. We just um, created some test files, a make file, and uh, just some header files and, and kind of um, empty skeleton functions, but that should hopefully get you started. So you can download that online with wget, or you can just copy it if you're on an AFS, if you have access to the AFS um, file system. So let me head over to somewhere new, and I'm gonna run this. So this is gonna copy that um, tar file and untar it. Okay, so I'm gonna head here. And now let's take a look at, at our crawl, crawler. So we just have this empty crawl function here. So if crawl fails, we're gonna be returning negative one, otherwise we'll be returning zero if it succeeds. Okay, so let me, I'm just gonna have some other code open at the same time here so we can compare. So let, let's say that we are gonna be running this with the file tester. So the file tester is setting this up and it's passing us these uh, fetch and edge functions. So. Um, the very first page I'm going to have to download is this is th this start URL. So let me just fetch that here for now. I'm going to say, uh, uh, I'm going to use this fetch function that was passed to me. I'm going to use that URL. And let me print that out. Well, first I'm going to assert that it's not null. So in reality, we actually, this could return null. Like one of the examples online is that there's a broken link. So it's totally possible this to return null, and you just have to deal with that, just like ignore the page then. But but for here, I know it's going to be valid, so I'm going to print off what the page is. Okay, and then this this fetch, fetch function is also mallocking space for you, so it's a lot. It's very similar to stirdoop. Um, so when stirdoop returns a string, you're responsible for freeing it when when you're done, even though you didn't malloc it. So in the same way, I'm going to free this page here. Okay, so let me let me build this again. And why is it unhappy? Because I misspelled that. Okay, and then let's run this on page A. And why is this in it? Oh, what's that? Oh, that that's a good point. <laughs> okay, so let me run that. And I see this prints welcome page. So this was actually page A. And um, so it, it's fetching it as appropriate, so you don't have to write that code. And then um, if I look at uh, if, if I look at the file tester, it's basically just asserting because um, it, crawl needs to succeed. And right now it fails because it doesn't actually do anything. Okay. So in the same way, I could um, I, I could run the web tester on index.txt. Um, and this will be a little bit slower, um, but this should fetch um, fetch that main page online. And you see, sure enough, it, it has that. Okay, so you don't actually have to write any of this fetch code code yourself. Okay, and what you're ultimately responsible for doing then is whenever you discover an edge, you need to call this edge function passing um, the page that it's linking from. So this is the page you found the link on, and here's where it's linking to. Okay, so that's basically the skeleton code um, you have. So, so these these callbacks are kind of a useful thing in general. I think you all have used. Uh, oh, yeah, question. So what is that? The client.c. What's that? Client.c. Oh, is there a client.c here? 
Um, I should have cleaned that up. I was I was making some changes this morning, and I was grabbing um, grabbing the HTTP fetch code out of here. So I'll, I'll clean that up. I'll make, make a note right now. Um, but you can just ignore that. Other questions so far? So yeah, I'll, I'll be deleting uh, client.c. That's not relevant. Okay, so, um, so, 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 you, so these kind of callbacks are useful in general. So I think you all have used callbacks before when you have quick sort. So you can have the general sorting function, but if you have a callback, then you can make um, QSort much more flexible and people can make it behave the same however they want. So th that's um, kind of the same principle here. Um, so let's talk a little bit about how you're actually going to build um, build your crawler. Okay, so I, I think there are there are a few things you need to do. Um, so I'm going to say to do here, and the first thing you're going to need to do, actually, let me just make this a multi line, um, is you're going to have to have a queue uh, uh, of links. Okay, and then. This will be uh, basically it'll be from the parser um, to the downloaders, and the other the other case is that you may want to start your program by pushing that start. Oh, where I've, I need to close this. Um, you may want to uh, begin by pushing this start URL onto this queue of links from the the parsers to downloaders. Okay, and we talked on the website a little bit about this and. Um, Basically, this, this is going to be a fixed size queue. So we're going to have you implement a couple of different types of queues um, so you can get experience with that. And then uh, um, also I'll talk a little bit about how the way we're making you do this will prevent a deadlock. Um, but this is going to be uh, this is going to be fixed size. And then um, the other queue is going to be a queue of, of pages. And we're just going to be going in the other direction here. And this is going to be um, unbounded. Okay, so you need to have those two queues, and both of these are producer or consumer problems of some sort. And the third thing you're going to want is you're going to want to make sure you haven't um, ha don't visit the same page twice. So you're going to want to have some sort of um, hash set. Okay, so those are kind of the three things you need to do. If I were doing this project, I would I would build this one first because it's a fixed size thing. We have a bunch of examples of code in the book how to do producer consumer. So this is just a classic producer and consumer problem. Um, so let, let's talk a little bit more about this queue of links. So um, there are a couple of uh, things to consider here. So uh, the parsers are going to be pushing um, links onto this, and when might a parser have to wait? Yeah, so the parser might need to wait when the queue is full. Uh, Full, so I need I need a condition variable, and then um, when might a downloader need to wait? Yeah, the downloader waits when the queue is empty. So you need a need another condition variable. Okay. And then, of course, you're also going to need a mutex because um, you need to use that in conjunction with your condition variable to make sure you aren't concurrently accessing your data structures. Okay, so you have those three three things, and that, that's been detailed a lot in the book. So let's talk about the, the case that's a little stranger. So we have the queue of pages. So let's think about this now. Um, so again, we're going to need a mutex. But um, when will the parsers need to wait on this uh, queue of pages? What's that? When there are no pages, right? When it's uh, when it's empty, when queue is empty. Um, so remember, this is unbounded, which means it's not. We don't have a fixed size. Basically, if you want, want to add something um, new to this queue, it's not like you have this fixed size buffer where you have to have space. You just allocate a new node, say for a linked list, and you add that. So when would the downloader need to wait? Any thoughts? What? Yeah, it should never need to wait, right? Oh, okay, so basically what this means is we'll need a condition variable here, um, but we don't need a condition variable for this side, okay? 
So and then we need the mutex. So basically what this boils down to is that our queue of links is going to need two condition variables, one mutex, and our queue of pages is just going to need one condition variable and one mutex. Okay, so that's um, how I build it. So I would build this one first since we have so many examples of that, and then, then you can think about how to, how to execute on this. And then we have a hash set, and I imagine that you might build that as, um, you, you might have some, you might like implement a hash table and then just not put anything in there for the value, or you could actually directly build a hash set. But basically that's just going to um, just need one mutex, okay? So, um, and, and then also for that, since you're maybe building this to yourself, we say on, on the website that it's fine if you want to um, download a hash function so that when you have a, a string, or so your string is going to be a URL or a link, um, you can use figure out where to insert that into your hash table. So we also even linked um, to one that you could potentially use this Fletcher32. Um, let me take a look here. So I think they have some code on this Wikipedia page that you could use. Um, so so basically my implementation, I just used this for my for my hash set. Okay. So. The other thing that you're going to need to um, use some sort of uh, uh, concurrency primitives for is figuring out when everything is done, right? Because crawl needs to wait until everything is processed and then you can return to, to the whatever program is using your library. So, so for this, we have to think about what we need to do. And, um, it's a little tricky because you could have work in one queue or, or the other, and the other one could be empty. So you can't just wait for one of these queues. You have to basically track how much total work is in the system. And you could do this in different ways. The way, the way I ended up doing it, and you could do something similar, is that I, I look at it as that I have these two queues of links and, and of pages. So I start off with one piece of work in the system, and I'm adding that to my queue of links. And so that page goes along for the uh, queue of links. And then it comes, the same page comes back on the queue of pages, but now it has content. So basically, a given piece of work has to work its way through both of these queues before it's finished, right? So you could keep some sort of counter um, where I basically say, hey, I, I have, I, I'm counting the total work in the system and, and work plus equals one when I add it to the queue of links. And then after I take it off of the queue of pages and I finish processing it, um, I could decrement the total, the, my work variable, right? And, and, of, and of course, as I'm getting rid of that one piece of work, maybe I generated even more work because maybe even though I'm done with that page, maybe I generated additional pages. Um, but if you do that right, you could keep track of the total work in the system, the total unprocessed work that flows through both these queues. And so once you have that, um, you can use a condition variable and another mutex on that, and uh, then you can wait until you're done in the main thread. So this. Well, you could do this different ways, but the way I did it, it needed uh, one condition variable, one mutex. Okay, um, so if you were really doing this properly, what you would also do then is after you, after the main thread is all done, it would send, um, it would basically signal to all of the workers, hey, the, all, all of you threads should exit, we're done. Um, I think there might be an example in the book where, where we do that. Um, what, what you could do is you could for example, send a, a URL that's maybe empty or somehow other indicate that, hey, this is the last thing you need to do. And you could send that to all the workers in the system. Um, we aren't really requiring you to do that. It's okay if you leave all of your other worker threads um, kind of just hanging out there. Um, we'll just exit after we call crawl once. Um, but you need to make sure that the crawl function returns at the proper time. So you'll need at least something like this. So any questions on, on kind of all the different uh, concurrency primitives you're going to need to use here and what you need to use them for. Yeah? Sorry, how do you, how do you use this condition variable here? So if a page goes through the first queue mm -hmm. and it gets parsed and it gets put into the second queue, mm -hmm. So I, I would increase the work on, well, I, I guess there's multiple ways you could do it. I mean, I, I guess you could also keep track of the sum of the queue sizes. If both queues are, are empty, um, then then you know you're done. Well, sort of. I, I guess, like, so let, let's consider you have a page A with a link 
to B, and that's all. Um, a can go through the length queue, and then you could download that, and then it could be going through, um, it could be going through the page queue. If you so you're so you basically you finish processing A, but now you also realize I have to do B. So if you if you decrement for A before you increment for B, then you kind of could falsely signal, oh, I'm done, because for a moment all the queues were empty. So you have to be a little bit careful about how you do that. Um, so basically what you want to do is you want to make sure that I, I count the work for B before I consider A done. Okay, so it's a little hard to just look at the queues themselves. Um, you probably have to keep a separate counter of total work in the system. Does that make sense? Questions about that? Yeah. So, so mm -hmm. Right, so it depends on how, how you do it, right? So, so the way I, I do it in my implementation is that when I push it on the link queue, I add one, okay? Now, now I, that's going to get downloaded and it's going to be coming back to me on, on the page queue, okay? So I pop it off the page queue. So now all my queues are empty and I'm in the middle of processing A, okay? Now I'm going to parse A and I see, oh, there's B. So I'm going to add B to that link queue and I'm also going to say, oh, the total work in the system is now two. And after I've done all the pushing of, of new links, then I'll say, oh, I'm done with A, so I'm going to decrement work by one. So then I'm back to one, right? So I make, I, I make sure I add work for new links before I decrement to indicate that I'm done parsing this one page. If you do it in the other order, then you're going to be quitting too soon. Does that make sense? Right, yeah, you have to, yeah, so basically what he said, you have to decrement before, uh, after you've totally processed the page and generated new links. That's absolutely true. Thanks. Yeah, question. Something goes wrong on my uh, set of threads in the program, and I call active one in that thread. Mm -hmm. So, so I think that, um, I, I guess it depends on what goes wrong. For example, let's say a malloc fails. I think it's like we won't test you in something that will make malloc fail. We won't do something of that size. So it's okay if, if, if everything just crashes. We aren't really re expecting anything of you. So I, I think that um, your, your work, your produce, or your um, parsers and your downloaders sort of crash because of a bug um, that you caused, but we won't really be testing that what happens if they if they run into some sort of condition and they need to stop? Like it, if, if say if you run out of memory, it's okay if you just stop. We won't test that condition. Does that make sense? So so basically, you should never really have any workers exiting until you're done. Okay, we won't have any tests that would cause that to happen. So does that make sense? Okay. So this is a little bit strange here, right? That we have. Um, a, well, first off, why would we want to have um, have a bounded queue? What's the advantage of having a bounded queue versus an unbounded queue? Yeah. You can implement it using your base, so it's going to be faster. Well, why why else is it um, is it uh, more useful in a lot of cases? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. If you're crawling the whole internet, this could get pretty large and you could end up running out of memory, right? Mm. So having this un unbounded um, queue of pages is actually bad uh, because we could eventually run out of, out of memory. Um, so we, we aren't making you do this in, in this code, but the way you'd probably want to do this is if, if you were going to have this unbounded thing and you were worried about memory, is you wouldn't keep the queue in memory. You'd, say, write it to desk where you have a lot more space. Um, and then you could you could be appending to a file and reading off a file in, in a producer consumer relationship, but you could still be using um, uh, using these condition variables for a file in your file system instead of a queue in memory. So we aren't, we aren't trying to make you use a separate file, but if you guys want to take this code and actually do larger scale scraping for whatever project, then that's something you'll probably want to do. You'll probably want to keep um, the queue on, on in the file system instead of in memory. And you're free to do that for this implementation as well. Um, there are a number of things you can do to make this implementation more real. Right? You could, if you're free to also parse, parse HTML references, um, keep this on disk, um, and so on. Okay, so this is this is a problem um, that we aren't going to really address. We won't give you so many links that you run out of it. What would happen if I had 
two bounded hues here for both the links and the pages. Why is that problematic? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. There's, we, we end up with a circular dependency where we, each one is, um, I, before I can finish my work that I just popped off one queue, I have to have space on the other queue. Um, and, and the reason why that can really happen is that when we generate links, we, we generate multiple links per page. So it's totally possible that both queues can become full and you get stuck. So we really have, for this to be functional, we actually, uh, one, one advantage of having you do both types of queues is that you can um, see how you use condition variables differently for bounded and unbounded but it's actually necessary to have an unbounded queue um, to avoid deadlock in this scenario. Okay, so you have to have an unbounded queue. The, the ideal way to do this, if this were produ production quality, is that the uh, second queue would be on disk instead of in memory. Yeah, question? If the second queue is full, um, wouldn't we just have to wait for uh, Donald Miller to get there and fall on queue? Yeah, so the question is, if the second queue is full, don't we just have to wait for one worker to get there and, and pop it off? And the reason why that might not work is let's say, well, let's say that we have um, each, let's say we had two bounded uh, buffers and each is of size one. And let's say the first page goes through the system and that page has like, 100 links on it. Okay, so I, I, I can't really finish parsing that, um, parsing that page until I've pushed 100 links onto the, onto the link queue. So I'm going to start pushing these links onto the link queue and maybe another one will get downloaded but now the download queue will also be full. So while, um, while I'm parsing A, A, if A, A has 100 links, that could end up filling up both of my small queues, right? A single page could have more, um, you don't have to have a complex example, a single page could have enough links to fill up both queues before you even finish parsing it. Other other questions? I don't I don't I'm not I wasn't sure if that made sense. Getting a quizzical look. Wait, so, so I think in that case, it just it just gets stuck. It won't ever get finished. Right. I, that's exactly what I'm saying. I'm saying it will get stuck and it will never finish. Um, if you have two bounded queues, because so normal producer and consumer is fine, right? Because it's just a one way kind of a one way pipe, right? But now we have pipes going in both directions between these two. Thread pool, so we can end up with circular dependencies. So when we have circular dependencies, we can deadlock, and that's um, uh, I, I could show on paper, maybe after after class, exactly how that could end up happening. Um, but yeah, yeah. Question. Would it work to have? Uh, yeah, I think as long as either of them is unbounded, it's okay. Uh, for this, for this assignment, so one, another one of the reasons we do the callbacks is we can kind of see what you guys are doing internally. So, for example, a test we might do is we might, um, we might, when you're calling fetch, we might simulate an extremely slow page, and then we can see how many requests you are issuing internally. So, for example, we can see, oh, do you have the proper, properly sized thread pool? Um, so... Uh, Yes, in theory, you could use the queues as the opposite thing, but that would break our test. So we, we, you have to use the bounded for the um, for the links and then the unbounded for the pages. Yeah, good question. Yeah, other questions? Yeah. Um, so since the queue behavior is undefined in terms of uh, the ordering of popping, mm -hmm. Right, yeah, so the question is, is that um, we aren't forcing you to process items on your queue in a particular order, so the programs, pe people could be outputting edges in different orders in different programs, and the answer is that's okay. What we'll end up doing is we'll, uh, for our tests, we'll look at all the edges that are generated, and then we'll perhaps sort those so that they're in the current order. So we're really, really look not that you output edges in a specific order, but that you output the correct set of edges. So we'll test things like basic correctness that you output the set, correct set of edges, and then also that you're um, uh, having queues of the right size and that you are issuing things concurrently in the to the degree that we've specified. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. So and, and all of these things, of course, right? We're we're specifying um, the the download workers that pull the parse workers, and and this queue size. This is the size of the bounded queue. Um, we don't specify anything about the other queue because it, it can grow infinitely large. 
Okay, so um, do people have any questions about uh, about duplicate suppression? Hopefully that that part's straightforward. I, I would do that last. I, I would, if it were me working on this, I would come up with my own data sets that are, are trees first. So I would implement the queue of links first and just test that heavily by itself, and then I would implement the second queue and then test that on graphs that are, are just trees, and then I'd finally implement this hash set and um, and this weighting. That, that, that would be the order I would do this if I were doing this project. I would test it carefully at each step. So, so all your questions about that. Um, yeah. Hash collisions? So you just, I, I don't think we're going to really do stuff on the scale that would um, uh, stress your, uh, your hash table. So you don't have to have a great hash table. You should just build some sort of hash table or some other data structure um, that does that. So you can handle hash collisions as you like. You could, um, you could have like a linked list in each bucket in your hash table. It's really up to you. It's a design decision. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. So there, I'm, I'm almost done here. There's just a couple more things I want to talk about. Gotchas. So we, we list a lot of these gotchas on, on the bottom of this page here. Little tricks. One of them is that you're probably going to want to use Sturto um, to, to parse these pages. Um, but Sturto, let, let's actually take a, a look at Sturto. Uh, so they, they talk about um, about what what it means to be reentrant, and, and basically the way they're using reentrant is they're saying is it is it concurrent? Can you call it multiple times by itself? So you could probably guess if you think about um, the API to Sturto, uh, you'd probably realize that hey, this is this is not concurrent because the first time you call it, you give it a string, and then if you want to keep processing the same string, you you just pass an all to it. Right? So you can, you can imagine, okay, I give it a string and I call it all a bunch of times. So now what happens if I have a thread, thread interleaving? Thread 1 calls stirtoke with A, and then thread 2 calls stirtoke with B, and then thread A calls it with an all. Now all of a sudden, thread 1 is parsing B's string, right? So stirtoke is not really going to work for us. You can try to probably guess that by the API, and also the man page will tell you that. So... They have other versions of, of stirtok that are re-entrant, or you might more commonly call them thread safe. So this stirtok underscore r um, will do that for you. So take a look at that. And in general, when you're writing code, think about whether or not the libraries you're using are or not thread safe. You don't actually have to make your own code correct. You have to make sure the libraries you're, you're using are thread safe. Um, any questions about that? So kind of the, yeah? Okay, so the last thing I want to talk about very briefly is how to use GDB uh, on these kinds of programs because that's going to be um, uh, be painful for you. So let me let me head back here. Um, it's going to be painful for you if you can't use GDB. If there's a deadlock, you kind of want to know uh, which threads are stuck where. So with GDB, you can easily tell that. So let me head back to my working implementation that has a bunch of threads. Um, and I'm going to copy uh, okay, so I'm going to move crawler 2 back. So, so basically I want this one to just sleep forever so I can take a look at the at the queues. Um, so I'm going to do that. I'm going to build this. Great, and then let me run my file tester. Uh, I'm going to run my file tester with GDB. And I start with page A. Okay, so let me actually, um, so when I'm running GDB, I'm just going to give it the binary name and then the arguments to file tester I'll put here after, after runs. So I'm going to say run page A. And actually, Okay, so that's running. So let me let me do control C. So I'm going to kill it. Now, if I want to actually see what all the threads are doing, I'm going to type info uh, threads, and I can see here I have three three threads. That's because I have um, I have the main thread, and then I started a producer and a consumer, and so I can see that I have this star uh, a star by thread one. So that means if, if for example, let's say I say uh, BT for backtrace, this stack trace here. Um, is a stack trace for this particular thread, right? So I might want to see where the other threads are waiting. So if I wanted to say look at thread three, I could say thread three, and I could say backtrace, 
and, and I could see that I, in my parse worker, it, it's waiting on this condition variable. Okay, so you can imagine, um, right, when you're building these queues, you'll have a size on the queue. I could, if I wanted to, I could um, debug in this way, and I could see, oh, who's blocking a condition variable? And I could say, for example, um, look at the size of my queue, and if the size of my queue is positive, and, I'm, and I have a condition weight here, I know I kind of just implemented the producer consumer wrong. So hopefully you can debug, debug in that way. So any, any last questions here before we wrap up about the project? Okay, so, so good luck, and I think next week um, there will probably be a discussion about, about the Linux portion.